looking outside like, look how sunny it is out there. We're going to try to be so engaging. Um, how's it going? Good? Good? Good day? Good snacks? Good lunch? <laughs> Good room? Can't beat the weather? Um, I'm Fern Mandelbaum. I teach a few classes at the business school, entrepreneurship from diverse perspectives, power, building the entrepreneurial mindset, and equity by design, building diverse and inclusive organizations. And I created all of those classes. And in so many ways, it's to be doing just what we're talking about today, which is how do we build momentum? How do we build and expand this ecosystem? What can we be doing? Right? When you leave here today, what are you going to do? So many of you are entrepreneurs. Get out there and do it. Right? How can you help other people? How can you be involved with organizations? How can you start organizations that can get people changing the way we think about who can do this? Look who's in this room. This is incredible to me. When we started this eight years ago, this isn't how the room looked. I mean, I, I just cannot tell you how excited I am. And the, the three of you, you were involved, you were, you were thinking about this eight years ago, but look at the organizations that you're a part of today. Like, wow. Um, in addition to teaching here at the business school, I also teach engineering PhD students um, in the engineering school, and I am a managing director at Emerson Collective, and I joined Emerson to start our early stage investing practice three and a half years ago. And at Emerson, we think of ourselves as consequential investors. What that means is we invest in companies that we believe will have top decile returns, have significant positive impact, often systemic level impact. And we will only invest in inclusive, equitable teams, ideally diverse. But if they're not diverse, we will help them. And we have to believe that they want to be diverse teams. Um, but this panel isn't about me. It's about these three people. So I am going to introduce these amazing humans up here with me. Um, Jennifer Garcia. Can, can we add just something to your bio? <laughs> sure. Um, anything interesting and I think aligned with the values of the people in this room that's happening in tech in Silicon Valley, Fern is somehow involved. Mm -hmm. So whether it's uh, very quietly whispering to CEOs and executive teams and changing minds a decade ago, two decades ago, or investing in founders who didn't typically get meetings with investors 10 years ago. Fern was doing it, and so um, it's, it, I, I'm, once a week I meet somebody and I say they should meet Fern, and they go, I met Fern you know, 15 <laughs> years ago, and she did this for me, and my you know, kid worked for her, and um, I hope my you know, grandkid worked for her. And so just, um, I think the resume does not capture the mm -hmm. actual impact that Fern has had on the people who come and speak here every week when they do their view from the top, you could, you could have a section on how do you know Fern Mandelbaum and what has she done for you? Thanks. I, I paid him to say that. That's the okay. only reason I'm here. Jennifer Garcia. Jennifer's career path has led her from the financial services to corporate America to consulting with small businesses to now the Latina Business Action Network. She currently serves as a COO. We're in partnership with Stanford GSB. Their focus is advancing Latina and Latino entrepreneurship across the country. Jen Neundorfer. Jennifer Neundorfer is an operator turned investor who has been investing in early stage startups for the last decade. She's the co-founder and managing partner of January Ventures a first check fund investing in visionary founders, leveraging diverse perspectives to transform modern work and health. As a Cuban-American, Jennifer is one of the few Latina GPs in venture, 
and she's committed to expanding access to VC and rewriting the networks in tech and venture capital. And I can remember when Jen was thinking about starting mm -hmm. January Ventures and it's just amazing to see what she's built. And Sean is a co-founding partner of Concrete Rose. He is a Bay Area native who has spent his career working to close opportunity gaps in Silicon Valley prior to founding Concrete Rose. He worked in nonprofits and philanthropy and as a venture partner at Next Play Ventures. And an interesting thing about Sean, you know, you hear so much about, you know, carry and management fees and Concrete Rose gives half of their carry to their foundation. And I hope you share a little bit about that, about that today. Um, this panel is, interrupt us. I know sometimes it's like talk and then you, you ask questions. We, re, we want this panel to be all about what you care about. So if you have a question, just, just let us know. There will be time at the end. Um, it, it's, it's to learn more about what they're doing, how they're impacting people, other organizations, and what you can be doing. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, could each of you share a little bit about your organization, what you're doing, and why you're doing it? Jennifer, you wanna kick us off? Sure, happy to. Uh, well, thank you everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited to be back in person. I've been um, serving on the advisory board for this conference for a couple years now, and it's been virtual, so I love the IRL where we could be here in person and build relationships and connections. So I serve as the Chief Operating Officer for LBAN, Latino Business Action Network. We are a nonprofit based here in Silicon Valley with a focus and a vision of empowering Latino entrepreneurship across the country. So we were started right here in Stanford by a Stanford professor um, by the name of Jerry Porras, Professor Jerry Porras. And we work very closely with Stanford GSB on three specific areas. One is research, the second is education, and the third is ecosystem development. On the research side, we survey Latino businesses on an annual basis to understand what is the operating environment. What are the contributions? What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? We take that data and we have our extended team under, under Deb at the CES analyzes the data, produces a report, we facilitate a research forum every year where we release the state of Latino entrepreneurship findings. Uh, it doesn't end there, right? Because what we want that data to do is to inform policy. We want that data to really um, inform policy on a federal, state, local level, but also within private institutions to understand are our practices, policies, procedures really creating an equitable outcome for all diverse owned businesses, all businesses really, but thereby Latino owned businesses as well. That's the research side. On the education, we run a business scaling program here at Stanford GSB under the exec ed department. This program is designed entirely for scale, for Latino businesses who want to scale their company. Um, just to give you a sense of, it's, it's co-designed by Stanford faculty and Elban. We augment that with one-on-one -on -one mentorship, a lot of focus around capital, capital preparedness, as well as bringing in the connections to capital providers. Um, we are a national program, so it is open to Latinos across the country. We're industry agnostic, and we do have a re revenue requirement, which would be either a million dollars in annual revenue or 500,000 in external funding. So the latter is for our tech uh, VC backable type companies. Today, we have over 1,000 companies from across the country that have graduated from our program. This is what we call our alumni base. And that really takes us into our third pillar, which is ecosystem development. Because you all know that 
growth and scale doesn't happen in just a program period, right? It takes the infrastructure, it takes the surroundings to really support you through that. And that's what our ecosystem focus does. We start with our alumni base, we take a network of mentors, our network of capital providers, corporate partners, and we ask ourselves the question, what do we need to continuously be doing so that we are empowering the ongoing growth of these companies? Um, so certainly we have focuses on access to capital, access to contracts, access to education and resources, and then access to sophisticated networks. So that's a little bit about what we do. I know that's, that's a lot. We're a, we're a small team with a big mission, uh, but really having a strong impact in the community. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to go next. And Jennifer, I love hearing what a comprehensive program you guys run. I think that's so important in so much of this, um, so much of the, the founder support. And you and I talked a little bit before about getting into actions, but a lot of that comes from a really comprehensive space. So I'm Jennifer Neundorfer. Um, as Fern said in the intro, uh, I run a fund called January Ventures. Um, I actually started it with a classmate of mine uh, from the GSB, so it's great to be back here on campus. Um, and we are a first check fund, so we focus on pre-seed investments in founders that are leveraging diverse perspectives to solve what we believe are the next big problems of our generation. Um, and we're firm believers that that diversity of thought is what will drive future returns. Um, and you know, ironically, in venture, we're in a business that rewards and incentivizes innovation, but there's actually been very little innovation in venture capital historically. And when my partner and I came together, and really, what we saw was that we were aligned on both what the issues were and where we saw the opportunity. Um, and it was really around diverse perspectives and diverse founders that we thought were gonna unlock the future returns. But the reality is that the networks in venture are so narrow that often those founders just face a lot of friction. Um, so much friction in building their companies, accessing capital. And what we firmly believe is like you can't take the network out of venture. It's how people sort, it's how we underwrite risk. But what we could do is build a fund based on a very different network. And so that's what we've done. Um, our two core values are transparency and access. It's not what venture capital is known for, but it's what we really believe is fundamental to building that different sort of venture capital firm, um, sourcing from a different pool, and then maniacally removing friction for um, the founders that we support as they build. Um, we're investing out of our second fund. We have about 55 companies in the portfolio, um, very geographically distributed and really diverse in terms of you know, their, their backgrounds, their identities, their perspectives, their geographies. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about our thesis and what that looks like in our portfolio, as well as some of the research that we've done about you know, why investing early at the, you know, investing at the early stage capitalizing founders from the start and being that catalytic partner is really this fulcrum point in the venture capital ecosystem. I love, um, you know, transparency and access. You know, at, at Emerson we talk a lot about that we think it's all about collaboration and teamwork, which you don't always hear in the venture industry. And again, how, how are these things you're hearing, how can they manifest in your own funds or in how, what you're doing. And so thank you for all that you just shared. But Yeah, well, and that, that point about collaboration, just to underscore Sean's point, um, I will never forget going on a walk for him with you around downtown Palo Alto when, you know, this was like just a little kernel of an idea. And the collaborative, the collaborative spirit and the generosity of, of time that you showed to us was, you know, was really important because just in the same way that I think we need to be there supporting founders. You showed up for us in that way as new fund managers, um, and really appreciate that. Thank you. you know my joke about our walk. <laughs> Go ahead. We'll make it here. Um, I'm not as concise nor precise as either Jennifer, so I'm going to stumble through this. And um, our fund is kind of rooted in my experience growing up here, um, and recognizing how special Silicon Valley is, and then also recognizing who was just not participating in the special things that were happening here. So I had my friends in Atherton who, when they went on vacation, they took their plane. And then I had my friends in East Palo Alto who, uh, like, what's the vacation? And you know, we're working at Safeway after school instead of you know doing the, th the things that um, 
me and my peers at my all boys Catholic prep school were, were doing. And I dedicated my career to you know, ensuring that the people who were living here who looked more like me and weren't accessing these opportunities were actually able to do that. And I started that in nonprofit and philanthropy. So I ran a boys and girls club in East Palo Alto and I advised the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative on their local grant making. And was doing great work there for a decade, could have done it for another three decades and been very satisfied with my life um, and happy with what I, how I was spending my time. <clears throat> but was realizing that despite doing better work, the problems were getting more significant for the families that were here. <clears throat> and then I looked up and I saw, you know, a, two blocks away from our Boys and Girls Club Facebook and realized that's, that is the true impact. Um, the wealth that's created with an organization like that and the global reach that it has and the way that it influences every aspect of, uh, of our lives around, around the world and said, if I really want to have a career um, dedicated to impact, it's got to be building companies like that and helping them do things the right way. And so I uh, had never been an investor and shared with a few folks, Fern actually was, was one of them early, uh, this vision for uh, my partners and I had for starting a fund that would um, build these inclusive, uh, diverse organizations and had no idea what it was actually going to look like. We spent a year um, in a residency at Sixth Street, which is a big private equity firm that does nothing like what we do, um, but was helpful <laughs> um, in learning how to build a financial institution. And um, we landed on, so this, this journey that was about impact became this recognition that there was a massive opportunity and this market dislocation that we had stumbled into that was really an opportunity to drive top decile returns for, for our investors. And so we developed this three focus area strategy, all early stage, so pre seed to series A companies is, is where we play and we're generalists. Um, first, we look at underrepresented founders with a focus on black and Latino, and that's the market dislocation that we all know about, and I won't shout those numbers out at you. Um, next, we're looking for companies that are meeting the needs of underrepresented consumers. And again, that's just massive market, fastest growing market, um, and massively underserved. Um, and for both those focus areas, the way that we actually help those companies is by leveraging what we call the Concrete Rose Network. So it's mostly RLPs who are operators and investors who have built the Facebooks of the world and who recognize that uh, black and Latino networks just don't have the same social capital. And so if you're building a, uh, a, a a uh, company that relies on building some type of network, we can get Jeff Weiner from LinkedIn to come and spend time with you, coaching you and mentoring you. If you're building a, if you're building, um, a telecommunications platform, we can get Eric Yuan to come and spend time with you and advise you and, and potentially co-invest. And so that type of social capital is really critical to accelerating those types of businesses where the folks who are starting them didn't work at Yahoo 20 years ago with all the folks who are now running the biggest companies and investing in the biggest companies. What's, what's different about our investment strategy for a diversity-focused fund is our third focus area, which is non-underrepresented founders with a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion um, who basically want to hire black and Latino folks, but either don't know any or can't get any to say yes or stay. <laughs> and what we offer them is coaching and partnership on first being very intentional about the culture you're building, so defining your values, uh, defining what those values look like when they're operationalized. What behaviors are actually um, do you value within your organization? What does it look like to have an inclusive meeting at X company? Um, and then we diversify networks. So we don't promise that we're going to help you hire a black person. We do promise that you're going to meet black people before you're actually trying to hire them so that when you are hiring them and you're sending out your email you know, to your network about here's the open job that we have, black people are naturally getting that because you know them and then their networks are being leveraged as well. And so we diversify networks by making these introductions, not, when, not, not, not at the moment you're trying to make the hire, but, but in advance of that. Um, the last thing that we do, uh, Fern mentioned, because we wanted to stay true to our, our, our vision of making impact, is we started a standalone uh, foundation, which we pledge half of our carry to. And so half of every dollar that we make will go into that um, foundation. We use it to fund, kind of fill in the gaps um, that you know, kind of industry will not uh, address philanthropically. So we're funding organizations like DevColor, which is a uh, black engineering um, network, ColorWave, which helps uh, ident uh, educate uh, black Latino professionals about startups. So how do you get somebody at Microsoft to take the risk of joining a startup? It's you teach them about the actual upside of doing that. Um, 
and we do a bunch of other stuff too, but <laughs> that's enough for now. <clears throat> I don't know, how many people in here are thinking about starting a company or starting a company or in a startup? Can you just, yeah, okay, cool. So I don't know about you, but like in my classes, I, I love bringing in some of these people that are doing it. And so we have three people who are funding and helping all these great entrepreneurs. And so I'm hoping you can each share one of the entrepreneurs that you're working with. You, you can call it a success story or just someone that, you, that you'd like to, to share their story. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with you first, Jen. Yeah, um, so this is always a hard question and I'm sure we all feel it's hard because there's just a lot that we would love to talk about. But I'll and talk we don't, we will, no one in here will say, oh, Jen talked about her yeah. favorite company. Well, and I'm ha this is actually one that I'm happy to amplify and because um, I love talking about the amazing work that our founders do. I think that is one of, that's a role that I take very seriously as, as an investor as I think one of my key jobs is to amplify yes. their stories, yes. right? And tell their stories exactly. so that it goes on to inspire other founders and people know what they're doing. So um, one of our companies, uh, a portfolio company that's here in San Francisco is a company called Pano, um, Pano.ai. And they are a natural disaster response, d detection, response, and mitigation um, platform. Their, their goal is to really be like the palantir of all natural disaster response coordination. They're starting with wildfires. And so it, this is like, it's near and dear to, I think, you know, my heart because I'm, I, I have two small kids. I worry about our planet. And what they are doing is really tangible to the safety and security of people all around the world. Unfortunately, we saw that in this last wildfire season that it's like, it's not just limited to a few states in, in the country. And, um, and it's a founder that I have known for, I've known for a while and I've just seen her operate and I've seen how her mind works. And she is like, sh she is just one of the most thoughtful people about how you break down a very complicated, very thorny issue into pieces that you can solve and tackle. She is also amazing at bringing people, you know, telling people about her idea and recruiting them to it. She's a great storyteller, communicator and motivator. And if you think about like wildfire or natural disaster response, it's, it's a really thorny problem that involves a lot of people that startups don't typically want to sell to, right? Municipalities, right. utilities, insurance companies, like that's the most attractive of the segment. And so when we were talking to her about this business, everyone had said no because it was like, how are you ever going to sell to these people? Yeah. But we, you know, I think, and the pattern matching that so often happens when investors look at a business, it was like hard segment, founder that falls outside of our typical founder archetype. Um, is this problem big enough? Like kind of all the check marks against her, but where we were able to look at this was like our pattern matching around a founder was really different. And so what we saw was a founder who had that tenacity and like a really unique way of thinking about a problem. She had not sold into utilities before, but she'd sold into really difficult buyers, had a great network and was able to bring those things together. Um, and so I mentioned that because just, I guess about a month ago, um, they were, they made Fast Company's most innovative company list and were in the top 10 most innovative companies in the AI space. Literally it was OpenAI Pano. Um, and so just seeing that sort of recognition for what they are doing and accomplishing um, just makes me thrilled for her, right? And really excited for what's ahead for that company. So I'm guessing in everyone's head out there is, how did she meet? How did she meet Jen? How, how did she meet you? Yeah, so this one, this is actually a founder that I had known um, in sort of multiple scenarios. So it's actually not a good way of, it's not the best example of how we typically source. This was a founder that I had known for a number of years. She was in my network. And so that allowed me to sort of have this longitudinal view of what she was like as an operator. But actually one of the things that when we first launched January uh, at the end of 2018, the headline in the press was venture capital fund launches with a cold pitch process. And now a lot of funds have a cold pitch 
yep. form and you know yep. they have something that they direct founders that they don't really want to talk to too um, which is how most of it works but we actually invest out of our cold pitch form and so for us we're really we lead with the fact that founders do not need to be in our network they don't need to go through the test of getting a warm intro to get to us frankly i don't want someone to filter my deal flow i want to be the first one to meet a founder and figure out whether they meet our thesis and whether they match the patterns that we are looking for in founders because it's pretty different than what um, some of the more traditional funds are looking for. Thank you. Jennifer, can you share? Yeah, so we have over a thousand companies, so there's hundreds of stories that come to mind, but maybe I'll share one that I think tells the story of the origins and a lot of, you know, you were talking about why you started your fund. Um, the origin of why these companies, oftentimes the ideas get started is because of a very personal connection that they may have to the problem. So there's this one uh, company um, by the name of Zocolo Health, who the founder grew up in New Mexico, rural communities, and she saw and she experienced how healthcare was very inaccessible to underrepresented communities and specifically also to rural communities. Um, thinking about specialty care was almost entirely unaccessible. She started this uh, health tech company, and while she has great government experience and industry experience, she'll tell you, no one tells you the skill sets required to be an entrepreneur. Um, so she went through you know, a little of the school of hard knocks. She actually participated in our program, and when she came in, it was transformational in a couple different ways. Psychologically, because she's a Latina who walked into a Stanford classroom with 75 other Latino and Latinas who are building incredible companies. But she walked out of the, prob out of the program with very specific ideas in her head. She had a clear value proposition, she had a clear go-to-market strategy, and she had a clear idea as to how to build her team. In what, what I think is really exciting for her now, I, I recently saw um, a, a press release that she issued. They have just partnered with Mark Cuban's Costco, uh, Cost Plus, mm. what is it? Cost Plus Drugs, yeah. Prescriptive Drugs. Wow. What does that do? That allows them to bring access to competitive price drugs, prescriptive drugs, for markets that have been um, underserved in this area. The ability that she has had, or the success that she has had to go to market in such a rapid pace, specifically for health services, she's gone, she's now in California and Texas in less than a year, which is quite remarkable for the health services industry. Um, I had an opportunity to chat with her the other day, and she said, you know, as we look to Series A, it's a different ball game, right? The, the stakes are higher, the bar is now raised, and she points to the importance of a thriving ecosystem. And this is true for every, every entrepreneur, to be part of a thriving e ecosystem, because now you need, your needs are gonna be slightly different in terms of the types of introductions and capital providers you're gonna be speaking to, but also the access that you're gonna have to new markets that you have not yet tapped into, partnerships, et cetera. So really excited, I think, from, a multi from multiple angles. One, it's a, she's solving a problem that is prevalent in lots of underserved and underrepresented communities, but also to see how, the, how we, as an organization, how Alban gets to play in, in, into her success by simply creating that ecosystem that's helping her thrive. So everyone in here, there are some people who are thinking, I want to be part of that. And there are some people thinking, I have a friend who should be a part of that. That's right. What is the key, th like, what? How? Yeah. And how, yes, great question. Come chat with us, take a look at our website. R actually, raise your hand if you have participated in the LBAN scaling program here at Stanford. I know there's several in the room. Um, nice. Talk to these individuals, talk to myself, but also I encourage you to go to our website. We have more information about the scaling program and the application there as well. So if you know, if you are one or if you know a Latino or Latina founder, point them in our direction. So again, this is all about, it is about developing a community. Those hands went up so quickly. Will you put your hand up, keep your hand up. What's your name? Beatrice. Beatrice, okay. And over there, what was your... Your name? 
Luciano. Luciano? Luciano's over there. Go after him and over here. Yeah, great. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Right? Like, look at all these people. Go, go get them when, like, we go out to get. Like, that is, you know, people often come up to me, even in my classes, and, like, I don't know. I, can't, I want to talk to Sean. And I'm like, he's right there. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Would he want to talk to me? He came because he wants to talk to you. He's not, I promise you, he's not going to do a beeline for the door. Everyone here today wants to help. I'm going to imagine everyone in this audience wants to help other people, right? Like, that is what this is all about. That ecosystem, that is what we're talking about. Make this part of your ecosystem. Sean, you go. T share you one of your next, successes. Should we go to the next topic? One of your successes. Um, I mean, it's, it's... Or a company you want to talk yeah, about. Yeah, the, uh, the company that I like to tell the story of because it, it just demonstrates the exact model that we... Um, but what we were building for when we built our model is a company called Asusu. Uh, we met them a couple of years ago. We were actually introduced by another investor who said, I like these guys, I don't like their business. Um, and uh, on our first call, there was like something, there was something red under one of their desks that we could see because their office was so small that you could see the entire office on the Zoom. And it was air mattresses because they were sleeping in their actual office. These guys were insane. Um, and obsessed, and they had both grown up, they were um, immigrants, uh, one is the, the, the son of immigrants, the other immigrated here, and had grew up you know, financially constrained, uh, financed their educations by like, patching things together. One paid for his first year of school with payday loans that his mother took out, and they were obsessed with bringing the 40 million Americans who just have no access to financial services into the system. And this was a theme that my partner Ian and I, who's, he's in the back, had been looking at for a while. We'd met all kinds of companies that were trying to help folks build alternative credit scores. And the issue that we had with most of them was that they were either predatory in some way, like the, the actual solution was worse than the, actual, than the problem, um, or they were just super inefficient and wouldn't scale. And Asusu was actually very s similar in, in that they did not have this efficient um, scalability um, that they had figured out when we met them. So we passed, but loved them. And one of the things that we try to do, is, one of our core values is to, is to just offer value to anybody that we meet with. And so whether we're passing on a company or willing to invest, we try to make a helpful introduction or help solve a problem. And so we started introducing them to folks in our network. And um, they figured out a new model that would allow them to go from um, adding adding users to the platform literally one user at a time, like go get a renter who wants to build a credit score by getting their, their rental payment uh, recorded and reported to the credit bureaus, um, getting one at a time to going to the property manager instead and getting a couple hundred folks on the platform at a time. And they realized, oh, if we go to the property owners, we can get a couple buildings at a time. What if we just went to JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs? What if we went to Fannie and Freddie? And so they, Fannie and Freddie came uh, several months after we made our, actually did commit and make the investment, and that immediately got them millions of people on the platform instantaneously using the product. And so uh, they were one of two black-led unicorns last year. Uh, so they raised $130 million from SoftBank at a billion dollar valuation. And thankfully, in the year since the economy has started to uh, look very different, the business is stronger than ever. So they've got Actually, we're actually constantly telling them to spend more money. They're still like living like they were when they were like 20 years old, and um, and, uh, and they're growing into the valuation very very nicely and um, and really solving some problems. And now it's exciting about what they're going to do. They've got three million people using the platform. What can they now? What can they offer them next? They're going to start doing mortgages. They're going to start doing all these really interesting things and changing people's uh, financial lives. Um, and. The, the thing, the key to their success was 100% them, but coming into, into the model that we had built, spending time, their, their, perfect, their CEO coach is Jeff Weiner from LinkedIn. Their advisor is actually a lecturer here, Greg Waldorf, who was the first uh, investor in Trulia and sat on the board of Zillow, so had this deep prop tech um, and real estate knowledge. Um, Jamie Gates, the, the founder of, um, of uh, I forget the name of the, owns a lot of property. Um, Starwood. 
start with. And so um, these are all folks who are in our network and, and, and are looking to work with entrepreneurs like ours and don't get to because in their own words, you know, I was working with 20 white guys who look like me 30 years ago, 20 years ago, so that's my network. And it's not because I'm, I'm you know, actively discriminating, it's because I just don't know people. And so we're calling, calling people out on that and bringing folks, talented folks in front of them and getting them to spread and multiply that social capital. It's an incredible company. It's an incredible company, incredible team. Yeah. Um, we could keep talking all day, but there's one, one thing I really want to hear from all of you is what is one thing that, that you've done or you think people can be doing to move us all forward? You know, I, I, I really did join Emerson to do two things, to what I refer to as build and expand the ecosystem and to try to minimize bias in the process. And, you know, what, what, what can we be doing? Can I answer on two things? What do you I think? Two is okay? Two is okay. <laughs> Everyone said two is okay. I'm going to tell it through the story of how I see my world through my children. So I have three small children, all very adventurous. You put them in a trampoline, they become gymnasts, right? You have a trampoline. If you imagine the trampolines that have the netting around them, so there's this protective shell. They know they're not going to fall off. And you put a basketball goal in that trampoline with them. Now you have a gymnast cross with Michael Jordan, and they're incredibly, you know, doing flips, making baskets, etc. They do that because they know that this netting is around them. They know that they have the infrastructure to support them, the scaffolding to take risks that they wouldn't otherwise take. And I think about that same concept for founders, right? Many of our founders don't have that full support network. They don't have that ability to say, I'm going to really take this bold and healthy risk. I don't know if I'm going to survive till the end of this quarter, but I'm going to try it anyway. Um, so one of the things that I would say is how do we create, and creating that is not an, a responsibility of any single organization or individual. I think this is where private markets, uh, academia, as well as nonprofits need to come together and create the, the infrastructure, create the scaffolding, so that founders have the access to networks, they could have the access to advisors, they have the ability to be bold, to be creative, to take risks, but they know that even if it doesn't work, even if they fail, that's okay, because they're going to pop back up again and we'll do it again, we'll try it again. So that's one part, is how we really build um, the support structure. The other thing that I think is really important is access. And I love how this is like your core value is access. And we were just talking about this. In my world, we talk a lot about access to capital and access to contracts, but really, it's just access in general. Um, for those of you that heard the panel where someone was speaking earlier, he referenced Stanford GSB, I don't know, 10 times maybe, right? And what does that tell me? It tells me how valuable his experience was here, how many connections that he was able to make. But not everybody has the opportunity to come to Stanford and access the network and the relationships that he was able to access. And so when I think about access, we all have something that we could grant access to, right? Information, introductions, resources, past experiences. Um, how can you grant access to your peers, to your colleagues, to someone within your network? How can capital providers grant access, whether that be to simply feedback to extended networks? How can organizations and institutions grant access to diverse communities and double this room, triple the size of this room, right? So one thing, you know, my second thing here is giving access to each other. I, I, I love that. Um, we were sitting outside and we're talking to this guy and Sean goes, I know you're thinking of something. And, and when I meet someone, I'm, I'm thinking who, who, someone in my brain can help this person. Yeah. And that's literally what I try to think about in, in every conversation I have. Who, who do I know 
you know, and maybe it won't be like an exact help, but, and you all, often what I find is that people think, I, I, who can I help? You know, everyone in this room can help someone, right? Whether it's someone else in this room or someone who's three steps behind you and quite frankly, someone who's three steps ahead of you. So really <clears throat> think about that. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, it's funny. The, the, I love the point about access. Um, and the way that sort of the, the inverse that we often talk about is like knowing what type of capital you have. And actually, before I start, for all of you that are founders in, in the room, like you're doing all the work. So this is sort of for, for anyone who isn't a founder, how we can, what we can all do to support the founders in this room. But I think knowing what type of capital you can provide. So there's financial capital, and we talked about the role of venture capital. But I'd actually, and, and there's a lot of friction in accessing financial capital. But I would argue that um, social capital and emotional capital are just as important. And yeah. Sean, I love your example of, you know, when you met Asus, was saying like, hey, we're not going to give you our financial capital, but we're going to give you our social capital and make introductions for you. And we're all here at Stanford. We all have some social capital that we can leverage. And even if you can't for a certain company or founder, you have emotional capital. And so those three buckets, I think, are really important in coming together to support those of you that are founders in the room and are really you know, climbing the mountain and doing the hard work. Um, the other thing that I personally think of and I would challenge everyone in this room to do, you know, I mentioned sort of amplifying the stories of the founders who are outside of the traditional mold of what it means to be a founder and build a company. And you know, that, that sort of traditional archetype is deep and the pattern is well worn. And it's our responsibility as people supporting different types of founders to tell their stories. And I say to our team, we will have been successful when our founders are household names. I and mean, it's not, you know, people don't think that to be successful, you're in the mold of Mark or Jeff but you're in the mold of Julia, right? Or whoever else it is. And so it's like, it, part of it is that simple. Let's tell the stories of the founders who are breaking the mold and doing that work. Sorry, I have to comment on everyone. It's my problem. <laughs> That's, those are my classes. You know, yeah. I don't, I love Jeff Wiener. I, he doesn't come to my class. And you're like, why wouldn't you have Jeff Wiener? I'm like, who in here looks like Jeff Wiener, right? Like, that's, we can read a story, right? Like, when you meet Wemimo Abbey from Isusu, you're like, whoa, this guy, you know, his mom, like, pawned her wedding ring to get, like, you're like, you created a unicorn? Like, what the heck? You know, like, you slept on an air mattress? Like, oh my goodness, the distance you traveled to create this company, amplify those stories, right? Let's, mm -hmm. let's change how people think about who can be an amazing entrepreneur. Like, the, yes. the, the people in their portfolios are like crushing it. I heard someone use that term when I was walking over here and it just cracked me up, so I, I had to bring it into the, you know, like literally like one guy passed the other guy and he's like, oh, you crushed it today. And I was like, I'm going to use crushing it. So, <laughs> so, but they are all crushing it, you know? So, okay. It's similar to what the two of you are saying. My suggestion, um, you know, whatever superpower it is that you have that you're using on behalf of folks in your network, just find somebody outside of your network and do it for them. Mm -hmm. So whether it's as simple as I review resumes for my friends I can help you find somebody who doesn't have somebody who can do that for them. Um, that's, uh, it's, it's uh, slowing down to do that is, um, is invaluable and it grows your network too. So that person who's outside your network will now be a part of your network. Everyone in here has a superpower. You know, I always ask my students, what's your superpower? Oh, I hate that question. Don't ask me my superpower. But if you ask that guy that walked along outside there about, you know, that's like crushing it, he's like, well, let me tell you the five. <laughs> what, do you want one or five, you know? And by the way, I, I, the people that I'm talking about and for those in the room that may identify, like I'm married to that guy, I have one of those guys, like I don't, like I love them, you know? It's just that they can so quickly talk about their superpowers 
Everyone in here has multiple superpowers. Think about them, right? Build on them, share them, help your friends, right? That's exactly like, like you all have these superpowers. Um, let's use them, right? Um, okay. Oh, time is up. Time is up, which means, which means we get to do a really fun activity. And, and these three people are going to walk around, but before they walk around, big round of applause. I, I have to say, you all made me so happy. You know, I, I've been watching throughout the day, and there's like a lot of like working on your computer, checking your email, and everyone was so engaged. It made me so happy. Thank you so much for being so engaged. Um, but they are very engaging. Um, so we're trying to crowdsource a list of organizations that are helping people, right? And sometimes people say to me, oh my gosh, how many organizations are working for on Latina entrepreneurs? And I'm like, not enough, you know? Because like these small organizations often are like, what are so helpful? And so we're just trying to crowdsource a list. Is there, are we putting up the bit.ly or is someone putting that up? Or mm -hmm. someone, someone, okay, perfect. So there's a, a current list and uh, recommended additions. And we're just gonna take like three minutes to do that. And then you can also access those for your own, you know, your own needs. And then I hope you had, were inspired to do one thing. Um, did you want to take a picture of him? He's so good. Um, to help any of these game changing organizations increase their impact. Mm -hmm. We're gonna do this for three minutes. Don't leave, okay? Three minutes. Well, you can grab a snack and then do it, all right? And they're gonna walk around, all right? And then come back, and we're almost done. So we're gonna talk amongst ourselves, right? What organization are you, do you know about, that you're part of, that are helping, helping move us all forward, build and expand the ecosystem? Okay. Do we have some ideas? Anyone want to share? Or anyone want to share um, something you're going to do? Can anyone? 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 Yes. Oh my, a, a list of everyone that, I bet, who doesn't want to, uh, who, everyone wants a list of who, I want a list of everyone that was here. Yes, yeah, including the pitches. Yes, including the pitches, yeah. Um, I was raising a question. I was like, I see there's a lot of a salary for African-American, Latinos. There's just really rare to see for Asian women. <laughs> and then in the Asian culture, right, like stability is like super important, right? I so can't for, exactly hear you. Is this, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. So I was just raising a question. I say like there's a lot of accelerator focus on African-American, or Latinos, yes. but really I see any for Asian, especially Asian women. Yes. And you know, reflecting as Asian for our culture, safety, stability is like super important. So it yes. takes a lot of courage to be an entrepreneur. And so yes. I wish like there's some kind of like support ecosystem for Asian women founders. Yes, no, thank you so much. A is anyone aware of organizations? So, so Thank you so much for mentioning this, Amy. And the fact is that there's been a lot of um, research done on, on Asian men and women. And we, we assume, actually, that they're all starting companies, that they're at the highest levels of companies. But as it turns out, that is not the case. And it's one of those really bizarre assumptions, biases that we have. And I'm, I'm so glad you brought this up. Um, is anyone aware of organizations? If if you are, can you drop it in that that web that URL and can you share right now? Yeah, yeah. I, I want to share uh, about Bitwise Industries. Yeah. Um, do people know about Bitwise Industries? Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So um, as a founder who, uh, who is from the central central uh, yeah Central Valley Central Valley and. Yep comes from an agrarian background, first generation college. And in the last 10 years, she's established this company that um, provides training in these communities, Fresno, Modesto, like in these communities, 
um, removes all barriers to get people into the classroom, including childcare, um, you know, money for yeah. whatever job they were doing to replace that money, as well as, um, you know, food, Ubers to bring them in. And then they have a software company that uses all of these graduates to give them experience as apprentices. Yeah. And during that time, they have full benefits yeah. um, and their employees. And they once they have something on their resume, then they get hired more easily. Yes. Yeah. Um, and the, the beauty of this flywheel is that they've also created like what we feel like is, you know, like the Googleplex, for example, here in the Valley, they've created that in Fresno where there's a, there's a really yeah. desirable commercial, um, commercial real estate space now that they, that they run with childcare, you know, with all the amenities that everybody would need to access these tech jobs. Uh, and that's really, that's revitalized the downtown you know, gone from like abandoned buildings to like now a thriving ecosystem. Yes. And that welcomes many, many more like young people to see this happening in their town and yes. they can be successful, you know, in this industry that can transform their lives and like generational wealth without really leaving their communities. Yeah, no, Bitwise is really incredible. If any of you aren't aware of it, um, for sure. Can anyone, does anyone just, I, I, Amy had that, that point and we can leave it as a point, and you can also say to yourselves, hey, that's th th those are some people that I can be helping or I can be thinking about, but does anyone know of an organization? I'd love to, anyone? All right, Amy, I am personally gonna get you some organizations since I do know a few that are focused on that, so thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Uh, the yes, exactly. Exactly, thank you. Pear does incredible work. Um, I have a comment. Comment, I, yeah. um, Suggestion, more so than anything. Yes. Um, I'm a founder, I'm a Latina founder, um, and one of the things that we did amongst each other was create a forum group. Of, Similar, similarly to EO, Entrepreneurs Organization, in which they have forums in which founders come together and speak once a month about all sorts of topics, what we found is that founders supporting each other was a really catalyst for opening doors, for psychological help, for just like opening sort of like more opportunities. So if you find other Asian founders and you can create that circle for each other, you can start sharing your network as well um, and start from there. I, and then, oh, sorry, I just have to build on that, right? Whenever you see like a, a problem or an opportunity, yeah, do it, right? Like, like, wouldn't it be great? I think that is, yes, I thank you. I love that. Yeah. And the last, the last thing I said, I'll say is that before I became an entrepreneur, I joined this company out of Seattle called Moving Worlds. Moving Worlds Organization is an incredible company that matches professionals to companies that are changing the world in different realms from public policy to non-for-profit organizations to smaller scale SMBs all around the world. And instead of you volunteering, you experteer. So you go into these companies and you act, and you help them with their marketing materials or you help them with their fundraising strategy, et cetera, et cetera. So this can be another way in which you can also be adding a lot of impact um, into organizations that are already in the trenches of impacting Asians and Latinos and Africans and so forth. So that could be another, and it can be either non-paid or paid. And if you go in the marketplace and you don't find an opportunity that's on, of interest to you, they create it for you so that you can actually add value in the ways that you know how to add value. And you know, when you think about adding value or helping, sometimes we're like, oh my, 10 hours a week, I can't, I don't, I don't have, right? It can be like a 15 minute call, right? A 15 minute call can like change someone's life. Like I know you're like, no, it's not gonna change your life. I mean, I go on like a lot of 15 minute little walks and I'll just try to think of someone like you, you can all help someone in that way. And yes, if you become more involved, yay, incredible. Um, but, but think of these small ways that you can help, that you can help other people. And, and I really hope when you leave today, again, many of you are here like, how am I gonna get funded? 
what, how am I going to do this? You know, and I'm, I'm more than happy to talk to you. Sean is, Jen is, Jennifer, Sarah, all, like all these people that were here, Charles, like they, the people that came today want to help you, right? And look, you may send them an email and they may not respond in like 30 minutes. Keep, you know, you've heard, be persistent. Right? I mean, you want them to respond in 30 minutes, and I wish I could respond in 30 minutes. It, it just may not happen. You got to be persistent, right? I mean, you heard today um, someone talked about, you know, having to reach out to 100 venture capitalists, and you're all sitting there, 100, oh my goodness, right? They're pretty cool people. Some may not be, okay? There may be 10 that are kind of rude, you know, like they're sitting there during the pitch and they're like, oh, what am I supposed to, oh, I'm picking up what for dinner? Oh. Um, you know what, forget them, right? A lot will be pretty epic and will have some experience in this area that you're working on. Like, what can you get out of that meeting? Instead of thinking about it as like, oh God, another meeting, like, when else would you get to just call Sean or Ian, right? They're going to meet with you. What can you learn from them? If they say, no, no, this isn't right for me, is there someone you, you think I could talk to? Or would there, do you know someone who would buy this? Or do, do you, a team member? Oh, my, I'm looking for a CTO. Any, do you know anyone? You know? So think of these things as, like, how can they be helpful? Um, a couple of other things that I heard today... Charlie Moore, you know, I, I just love this one. At the end of the day, value each other, build teams, and value diversity in teams. The business that do that really thrive. I'm guessing everyone in here thinks that. You know what we have to do? We're showing the world that works. That is my whole reason for being. I invest in founders from what I refer to as hugs, historically underestimated groups. I am also one of them, right? URMs sound like an alien or something like, to me, hugs are like that, like so many people in here, right? If we create that Asusu or that Guild Education or Better Up or, you know, companies that are run by people, you know, Eddie Medina, Rachel Carlson, Charlie Moore, right, that are, people are like, I wanna be a part of that company, that will change hearts and minds. That will, we all know the data. We didn't have a big session on data, Dave. Everyone knows the data in here, right? We can all like get all depressed about the data. Let's change the data. Let's change the data together. Um, and then Charlie must have come, like I'm gonna have him come to my class on inclusive leadership. All the bad decisions were on me and all the successes were the team. If you're not comfortable with that, it's gonna be a long, tough time if you're not comfortable with that reality. The leader owns the failures 100% without exception and the success is shared. I really take this to heart, right? I can't tell you, it drives me crazy when I'll talk to a leader and they're like, oh God, VP of marketing, oh. And I'm like, who hired the VP of marketing? Like, uh, me? Oh, okay, so what the heck, right? What is this about the VP of marketing, right? And our job as leaders is to make our people be successful. That is an inclusive leader, right? Someone who thinks, how can I make my team be successful? Because if you're successful, we'll be successful. Um, raising money, okay, this is a really important one. It's not just about finding the right VC firm, it's about finding the right VC partner for your business. Understand their specialization and how their experience can help your business succeed. Okay, I know some of you are like, I just want anyone to invest in my company, Fern. You know, and I get that, I get that, I, I really do. Um, remember, once they're on your cap table, they never go off your cap table. You can't like say, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't really like you anymore. Like you're, you're just not really helping my company, right? You can't actually do that. So you have to, even in that moment of like desperation, right? You need to make sure, do they understand what you're trying to do? 
right? Are they going to help you? This is your board. These are advisors. But when you, when you work with a venture fund, people are always like, I really want to talk to Bessemer. And it's like, it's not Bessemer. It's like, you know, Tess Hatch, right? Like it's, it's those partners. So think really hard about who those people are. Um, this BS shared this. And I'm, I'm guessing there are people in here that feel this way. Sometimes I, some days I think it's a superpower power to be a URM, but sometimes I wake up and think, I'm so tired of representing URMs, but you'll not break me. My life has prepared me for this moment in entrepreneurship. I'm constantly reminded I'm a minority and I struggle with this. Some days I'm so proud of being a female founder, and some days I want to say, don't look at me as a female founder, but as a founder, and let's talk about the business. Oh my goodness, I get this. You know, 10 years ago, I, I would get invited to every panel in Silicon Valley, you know, and I'm like, God, I am good, you know? And it's like, no, I'm the only woman, you know, they could think of. And you know what? My job in that moment was to be really good. You know, and then just like, it, then they wouldn't think of me as the woman VC or the woman entrepreneur, but like someone who was doing a great job on the panel. And, and yes, sometimes people refer to me as the woman, you know, it, it, you're going to feel that way sometimes. You, just, you are. And what we have to do is just make sure that everyone knows you're an incredible entrepreneur or an incredible investor. And then you happen to be whatever you are, Asian, black, Hispanic, whatever you are, OK? And that's I, our job to keep building momentum, right, is to do it, is to get out there and just make it happen, right? and help each other. Don't just go out there and like do it for yourself and look at everyone else like, look, I did it for myself, like, oh, good luck to you, right? We must help each other. That is the only way we're going to build momentum. It really is. I mean, look at this room. Deb, is this incredible? Eight years ago, this was like a dream, you know, that we would fill a room with such a diverse group of people. Like, I am so delighted that you're all here today. I, I can't tell you how I, I, I have a cold. I, I have like, I don't know, I have like everything right now. And I just was like, I must come. I must be here and be with the incredible people in this room. However I can help you build momentum, let me know. Thank you all for being here. You're awesome.